Hi. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, and good day, I think, to uh, everybody who's uh, trying to join us. Um, my name is Julian Sefton Green, and along with Kylie Pepler, we're uh, bringing to you a series of events or webinars where we're trying to bring together uh, speakers from a variety of disciplines to reflect on making and learning from both sides of the Atlantic. We're all taken with what is new about digital making now. Why is it, does it appear to be having its kind of moment in the sun? We want to explore deeper questions about why digital making is important and how it also relates to other forms of creativity. We want to consider questions about how we can best organize digital making for children and young people. Many people think that digital making is difficult to teach, but I hope that we'll all share examples today uh, and in the succeeding uh, episodes, which show that that may not be the case. We also want to explore the larger place of digital making communities. We want to explore some of the upcoming developments in technology itself, as well as considering how we can link schools and young people to this wider circuit of production and making, which is not only a question of bringing together uh, hobbyists and enthusiasts, but also has great kind of um, salience for growth in marketplaces uh, and uh, commercial growth around the world. So today's uh, webinar brings together uh, four uh, experts uh, and practitioners who have focused on the question of physical computing. Um, so um, subsequent episodes in the series will talk about coding and programming, but today we want to concentrate on for lack of a better word, the digital things. Um, obviously, many of you are going to be familiar with the arguments that there is a new generation of simple to use, cheap and accessible digital equipment. And this has great uh, implications for manufacturing and production. Recently, obviously, uh, with the uh, 3D printers, but wearable sensors, haptic computing, uh, and all sorts of um, curious and amazing sensors seem to have kind of crept that into a very con common use. And they have the potential to change everyday life and conventional economic models. But besides um, their applications, they also seem to offer a new way for young people to learn about and engage with technology, to understand the nature of the technology itself, as well as obviously to inhabit these new worlds and to think of new and creative ways to apply them and develop them in all sorts of different social contexts. So what we want to do in this session is bring together the most exciting new developments in physical computing. Why should we learn about physical computing? Um, what skills and experiences does making teach? So we have uh, four speakers for you, um, but before we introduce those, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kylie Pepler, who teaches um, at the University of um, Indiana in Bloomington, um, and she's going to ask a few more questions and raise a few more issues specifically relating to the topic under discussion today. So, Kylie, can I hand over to you? Thank you very much. Sure. So my name is Kylie Pepler, and I uh, want to talk to you a little bit about some of the key tensions that are emerging in this landscape of physical computing and making. And I think uh, some of the things that you're going to hear our speakers speak to today are going to be about how these are being adopted in educational settings as well as industry. Within educational settings, we, there's a whole host of challenges. You know, these uh, uh, new technologies, while being cheap and accessible, as Julian had mentioned, uh, also uh, present some cost to our institutions. They also have a quality that, uh, a time intensive quality to maybe print in three dimensions or um, uh, to sew a circuit. And so, how do we think about these uh, technologies both within and outside of school and non school settings? Uh, and uh, further, as we, we move through the episode, our speakers are going to be talking to several guiding questions. And so they're going to be speaking to these issues about the most exciting new technologies um, in physical computing, in their opinions, uh, why people learn about new, uh, physical computing in these settings, what skills and experiences does making teach, and how do these new developments change and challenge the subjects of design and technology, and further, how should we structure learning with these experiences? And so they're going to speak uh, with their host of experiences um, to these questions. Uh, Julian, do you, would you like to introduce the speakers? Thanks so much, Kylie. We have four speakers today. 
um, and uh, they are as follows. Um, on my left, but I'm not too sure whether it's yours, we have Ben Leduc Mills, who's currently a PhD student in computer science at the University of Colorado Boulder, working in the Craft Technology Lab. He also works as an educator or hacker at Spark Fun Electronics, which is an open source hardware company in Boulder, committed to enabling tinkerers of all ages to build the gadgets they've always wanted. Our second speaker is Dave Mee, and Dave uh, designs and creates unique interactive experiences using software, technology, and social systems. He's got a background in gaming, writing, interactive and visual design, and techno tinkering. He's also one of the founders of the Manchester Digital Laboratory, known as the Mad Lab, which is a non-for-profit space for creative, cultural, and digital practitioners to collaborate and increase access to fruitful serendipity. Um, our third speaker is uh, Christian Mackay, who is a doctoral student in learning science at Indiana University. And he has come to the Creative Labs team as a working sculptor, uh, having trained at California College of Arts. Uh, he's in a prior life, he's uh, been a helicopter mechanic, an arborist, a foundryman, and a high school art teacher. And I think uh, it's fair to say that these have all shaped his divergent thinking in education. And our final speaker is uh, D.K. Arvind, who's Professor of Inter Informatics at the University of Edinburgh and Director of the Centre for Speckled Computer, about which I hope we're going to hear a great deal more. Specs, the uh, website says, are minute semiconductor grains that can sense and commute locally and communicate wirelessly. And I think the ambition here is for thousands of specs to be scattered and sprayed on people and surfaces in order to collaborate as programmable computational networks. Works. We'll hear about those um, as the discussion unfolds. Just before I'm going to ask um, Ben to start uh, talking, can I also remind you all, please, that we have a Twitter feed, which is hashtag digital making. Please, can you comment on the hash on the Twitter feed um, as we go along? And if possible, we will also try to take questions from the Twitter feed into the conversation. So the event will um, we're going to ask the four speakers to speak directly to camera um, over the next. 20-25 minutes and then we're going to engage in a conversation and we hope you the wider audience will be able to join us in that wider conversation. So can I hand over to Ben please. Yeah thank you Julian that's great to be here so uh, I think to start off I'll talk about the kind of two strains um, that I work in and that I see as possible futures um, in this community so uh, those two being digital fabrication and kind of introductory electronics or accessible physical computing. Um, and these kind of correlate to the two positions that I hold, um, one at the University of Colorado in the Craft Technology Lab and one at uh, SparkFun Electronics being an educator. So uh, my work at the Craft Technology Lab um, essentially focuses on a range of products or interfaces that try to answer um, how we can get kids into digital fabrication, how can we scaffold them to be able to model and create uh, specifically for 3D printing. Um, so we, we take a lot of our pedagogy from the ideas of, um, you know, starting with like Froebel, um, just the guy who created the first kindergarten, um, he strongly believed that kids should be playing with physical objects. Um, and that this kind of lineage has a long history and um, goes on and on, but um, there are a few uh, salient um, things in, in cognitive uh, science, like embodied cognition, right, which is the idea that your physical bodies actually play an integral role in how you sense and perceive and process the world, um, which is why we work on tangible interfaces. Um, for kids, and so uh, I'm sure I'll get to talk a little bit more about that um, and what specifically I do there. Uh, and in the um, realm of electronics, so SparkFun has been kind of uh, a leader in, in open source hardware for a while, but only recently have we uh, started an actual education department. Um, and our department there has the goal of assisting teachers and creating curricula and tutorials all with the idea of getting novices and, and kids specifically 
um, feeling like they can um, do this embedded electronics, create um, their own ideas with physical computing. And we're there to kind of provide the resources, provide professional development for teachers. Um, we're going on a national tour this summer. We have, I think, around 60 stops across the United States that will be um, actually on the ground kind of doing these workshops uh, in person. And we're starting uh, a wide variety of initiatives, um, some of which uh, I can talk about and some of which I, I can't yet. But um, we're, uh, we're very excited and we're actually, um, you know, we had the goal when, when this department started of really kind of changing the face of electronics education in the U.S., making it more hands-on, making it more immersive, and we're actually starting to get some traction in that area. So uh, this, is, this is actually a really exciting time to be involved in this kind of research, uh, and uh, I, I'll keep it brief for now and, and pass it on, but those are kind of the, the things that I see. Uh, and, and actually... The future uh, of, of, of kind of this area, since we're, we're kind of postulating here. Uh, so I talked about digital fabrication, and I talked about beginning electronics. And I think the, we'll see in the future um, kind of how these two areas are going to combine. So how do you print, 3D print with smarter materials? How can you embed computation in the actual physical processes that you're working with? Um, and, and this has started to happen in a lot of ways with, you know, like wearable computing. But I think uh, we'll, we'll see a continued kind of push in this direction of making these kind of ideas of electronics and digital fabrication kind of coming together. So that's it for me. Hi. Thanks so much indeed, Ben. Uh, we'll come back, and I'm sure people will have questions, specific questions to ask. Let me hand over now to Dave me in Manchester. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks Ben, thanks uh, uh, Julian and Kylie as well uh, for, the, for, the ch for the chance to be here. Um, yeah, so um, I'm from quite a different background, I guess in, <laughs> in many ways from Ben and from most other people here. Um, I'm one of the founders and uh, I guess organizers of a uh, community space in Manchester called MadLab. Um, in many ways, we're kind of, I guess, a bit of a traditional sort of hack space, but we've taken a slightly different approach in both our pricing model and also uh, the communities um, and, and um, subject areas that we're interested in. So we have a, we try to maintain a very, very democratic um, uh, zero cost model where no one um, needs to pay to participate in, in things that we're doing um, or to kind of commence or, or keep their own communities um, operational. Um, but we also do um, um, a lot of work with, with physical computing, particularly with Arduino um, and IoT platforms um, at the moment. Um, so one of the things that we um, we set up um, within the kind of our first year of operation um, is um, uh, a project called the Omniversity um, of Manchester, which is a, um, uh, a training program in what we kind of think as near future technologies. So it's exciting projects like um, projection mapping um, and uh, SAP programming. Um, but as well, we've been doing Internet of Things and um, a, a kind of, a, I guess, an, an introduction to physical computing, which has been uh, enormously successful. Um, what we're finding increasingly is that um, educators um, are coming to us, um, trying to figure out kind of how to deal with, um, I guess, a new environment for ICT education in the UK. So we had, um, I guess if I describe it as the, the, the Gove bombshell um, around a year ago, where he decided that... Um, Sorry, so Gove's the British Education Minister, um, and he, he basically decided to um, rip apart a, a, a lot of our kind of existing educational models. Um, I guess the thing that he's gone at any respect for has been his approach to ICT, um, which which has been in the UK predominantly been around developing the skills to use, you know, Office software, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and not really do anything beyond that. Um, so we've been, <clears throat> in parallel, we've been developing our, um, um, our own kind of Internet of Things and uh, physical computing courses around Arduino and some very simple electronics and, and programming skills. Um, we've been teaching that for a, a few years to 
an incredibly diverse um, audience range. Um, so we see, you know, on, on one side we're seeing kind of um, professionals um, who maybe they're developing physical installations, maybe they develop kiosks um, um, for deployment in museums or, or exhibitions. But the other side we're seeing kind of kids coming into the course who, um, you know, they've kind of almost outgrown what they're doing at school. Um, and, and you know, want to want to kind of explore more interesting spaces um, with technology. And, and I kind of find it quite fascinating the, the, the number of, of professional educators that come to what's effectively a community-driven organisation to get a sense of where where things are happening now. Um, yeah, I mean, as a I can go talk, talk about this later, but. Um, the other thing we've done is, um, with Stephen Flowers, we've established a, a, an under-18 um, a kind of coding club for, for kids um, who are really into technology. So um, it's kind of, I guess, it's like a Saturday club, and um, I think there's a, a periodic evening club that happens. So kids can kind of turn up and, and work on their own interesting um, kind of computational projects. So we did that originally as part of Young Rewired State, which is about, I guess, civic env engagement for uh, under 16s and, and developing apps. Um, but what we found with that model is there was a very interesting approach we took of, of um, attaching kids together with mentors, so professionals from the field, professional kind of um, content site developers or, or um, proper computing engineers and computer scientists and to develop their skills and their kind of um, awareness of where um, applications uh, can exist. So I think there's, there's very interesting stuff that's that's coming out of that is other things that happen on the periphery. So it's fine to be able to develop an application or a, or a service, but it's understanding that uh, broader context of where things fit that I think is one of the skills that's hardest to convey to people. Um, We've also found that there's been um, a huge amount of interest from kids as well in, in, around physical computing, and I think I mean I, I think everyone's had the same experience here. Um, but there's um, uh, there's something that's quite fascinating about the the range of skills that are required currently to do things with physical computing. So we're talking about you know things like electronics at one level. Uh, we're also talking about um, cross-compiling and working with different development environments, dealing with lots of different languages and bridges and glue that needs to be put in place. So I think we're kind of looking at a moment where things are kind of a little bit chaotic, nothing's quite settled into where it's going to be for the future, but um, it, it's an area that kids can really kind of latch into um, because it's very, very, I think it's fascinating how easy it is to follow along um, the development process. So that the, 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 the the synergy that there is between something that's physical and tangible um, and also with the software and the procedure and the computational um, thinking and modeling that needs to reinforce um, reinforce that. Um, yeah, um, I guess that's I guess that's a fairly rounded introduction to where I'm coming from here. Um, thanks, Julia. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Dave. Again, I'm sure people will want to come back and ask questions. Uh, third, I'm going to hand over to Christian, and we've got some slides as well, which we'll try and uh, interpose over Christian while he talks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for the invitation to join in the conversation today. Um, so I just kind of want to give a little background on myself uh, into the, the conversation here as a, as a working artist um, uh, with my MFA in sculpture from California College of the Arts. Um, I'm coming, coming into this uh, from a professional culture of individuals who have always referred to their own practice as one of making. And I've thought a lot about the way that artists, uh, the, the processes that artists use to engage the world um, in a very holistic manner. Um, and I'm really kind of interested in that scientific and uh, other systematic methods uh, that artists use to investigate the questions they have about the world, our place in it. Uh, and the interpretive physical creations that come out of those investigations is both poetic and, uh, and at times, uh, didactic works of art. Um, but I've been really kind of interested in the way that those processes themselves are an important and a potentially useful way to think about uh, how any of us may be learning. And um, so what I'm trying to, uh, to illustrate is with, the, with these ideas is that uh, there's both a way in which the transdisciplinary thought practice and interpretations through the crafting of physical objects engaged in uh, 
by artists can lead to rich forms of knowledge and ask them how we can consider this practice in the sense of the educational and learning environment. Um, my own artwork, um, just to give a little brief background of kind of more of what I'm talking about, is uh, been focused on how we move through effect and are affected by the spaces we, we reside in and trying to locate um, the ways in which we ourselves and others are both connected and disconnected. Um, and also how seemingly disparate elements uh, in the world are, are in fact interconnected. Um, so this uh, first slide is um, just a project that I had, a couple projects of mine, uh, one walking with a, a weather balloon uh, with a camera gondola underneath it transmitting an image to me. Um, so how do we remember the connection between the camera and the balloon that served as one of the platforms from which um, it first began to image the world? And how can we reconnect that history to our modern technologies that allow us to transmit those images at the speed of light, all in the name of disrupting one's sense of space in a familiar setting? And how can we consider the humble door as being something beyond the simple shutter to the gaps through which we cross thresholds? Uh, what shape can we give the door to arc out an impression in space of the forms that call us to move? The church bell, the fire alarm, the dinner bell. Um, I also have been looking to um, uh, Jenny Holzer and Ed Ruscha, Barbara Kruger, kind of the ways that they're, they're artists who uh, record the banal world that we exist in and um, ways that give us pause to kind of reconsider our place in it and the shape of it. And then I also look to um, uh, these two research, design and research based collectives, um, Simpark and Spurs. And they don't really necessarily seek to answer questions with their work, but uh, rather to find the questions that need asking. And they deeply consider history and sociocultural constructs within their projects, which range from the installation of dead horse decoys that function as listening posts next to a border patrol station, to building communal spaces of urban gardening, cooking, and eating around which to develop uh, dialogue about the commons. <clears throat> so, so these kinds of ideas um, within art and kind of looking at the world um, through these kind of uh, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, lenses and finding all the kind of interconnections um, that kind of exist in the world that we tend to think of as being uh, uh, disparate from each other, um, I think is a really kind of uh, critical way to um, to kind of be thinking about making uh, in in these uh, digital environments and, and through digital uh, uh, physical computing. Um, so considering these art, design, and craft-based processes, I've been putting together a mobile maker space um, by designing and implementing a flexible mobile maker cart um, that's been incorporated into uh, uh, a K, K through 8th grade uh, school in Indiana. Um, it's the cart, it's designed to, as designed, it consists of just an industrial machine uh, tool cart uh, that houses and keeps secure, kind of primary fab lab uh, tools, um, desktop scale versions of uh, uh, the laser cutter, a vinyl sign cutter, 3D printer, a sewing machine, uh, soldering stations and various hand tools as well as circuit building components. And the cart is uh, it's a flexible kind of mobile platform that allows the possibility of the tools to be brought directly into the classroom. <clears throat> and it's really kind of intended to um, it's to introduce the teachers as well as allow the kids to obviously to to work with uh, with these tools and processes um, but um, um, but it's really to kind of introduce the the capacity and the affordances of the tools and processes uh, uh, to the teachers uh, in order that they might find a way to incorporate that into their curriculum um, so as the cart's been coming together I've uh, been uh, working with uh, with the school directly and um, kind of incorporating some um, uh, some projects. Uh, one of which, uh, uh, as an example, is uh, an interactive book, um, which uh, kind of works to foster an uptake of a design studio based atmosphere of making uh, within the pre existing teacher culture. So this book uh, consists of a simple six page zine fold book. 
that the students draw, uh, in which the students draw a simple graphite circuit uh, that triggers events in uh, the Scratch programming environment through a Makey Makey board. And uh, what, what I see a value with this project is, um, uh, and others like it, uh, that, that you see um, uh, so ubiquitously in, in maker culture, is the capacity for the students to engage in working across multiple literacies, uh, from developing stories through, um, through uh, making circuits and learning about circuits to programming. And I, I think that this is kind of the fundamental strength um, in the physical crafting of objects um, by kind of looking at it through the lens of artistic craft and design-based making. And uh, it's what I see as a valuable way to consider how we, uh, how we might think about incorporating art, uh, design, and craft-based processes and modes of thought into the learning environment. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my, um, that's where I'm coming from with this uh, as I come into this. Thanks ever so much, Christian. That's, um... Terrific. Um, we are, you are broadcasting some images which are in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, we haven't been brilliant at managing to get those to broadcast in the main window. So can I encourage all viewers, please, to look at the bottom right-hand corner to see the next set of slides. Um, so can I hand over now to DK Arvind? Okay. Thank, th thank you very much. Thank you for, for inviting me. Can I have my slides on please because I'm going to talk to my slides so while that is being uh, worked I'm, I'm going to briefly introduce myself so um, I'm a university academic I'm from the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh I'm a computer scientist and the first slide that you'd see that you'll see is um, gives my affiliations which is um, the Center for Speckle Computing, which is a research center, and this research has been conducted since 2002. So in some ways, we have presaged some of these ideas which are currently in vogue, such as the Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine or M2M. -M. So that's very pleasing in some way. Um, can I switch to the second slide, please? Okay. Um, So um, we can skip the second slide because that gives you some some idea of the uh, um, of the of the people. So uh, let me let me sort of um, give some idea as to the um, um, yeah the second slide did 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 show up briefly. Okay. Sorry, can I just interrupt to say that for viewers, you, you need to click on the window which has got the slides in on the bottom right-hand corner, and that will bring up the slides as the main broadcast. Okay. Um, DK. So, um, the, the, in 2002, so this is the scenario that we are thinking about, is um, we were thinking in terms of what is the future of the internet, and uh, at that time, the uh, the namespace, if you want to call it that, was was getting uh, was getting quite short, and the new Internet of the IPv6 protocols were were coming along, which meant that uh, you could have unique names for 35 uh, separate uh, sub networks, and uh, each of these could be uniquely uh, addressed, and that seemed like a a huge opportunity which shouldn't be missed. Um, so the idea here is that um, you, you have these devices. Um, these devices are intelligent in some ways um, because they have the ability to sense and you can process the data that you sense and network wirelessly with other such devices. And uh, they're context sensitive. In, in other words, they know something about the environment in which they inhabit. And they're also location aware. And location awareness is uh, very important important attribute because quite often the data that you sense you want to know where you sensed it and when you sensed it so so the time and location are extremely important um, in the data that you uh, that you sense so um, and can we go to the next slide please and the and the vision of uh, speckle computing in 2002 was 
to be able to endow persons and objects with the sensing, uh, processing, and wireless networking capability. So, um, and uh, so you can take uh, a dumb object such as a, say, a coffee mug or something of that sort, and be able to have a sensor on it which can say sense the temperature, uh, and when the coffee level goes down to a certain level, then it could be refilled, for instance. So it kind of uh, talks to the, um, in this case, to a uh, um, to someone who's serving the coffee, and you're able to sort of refill the coffee. So, um, so the ability to wirelessly network is extremely important. And what you're essentially doing here is you are linking the physical world that we inhabit, the world of sensory data, with the virtual world uh, of digital information. And, uh, and what you're able to do now is that the physical world that we inhabit is a primary site of interactions. So the aim of spec computing was to bridge the physical and virtual worlds. So that was the, the aim. So can we go on to the next slide, please? And what the next slide shows is a um, um, it's it's a, a a busy slide, so I'll, I'll sort of uh, lead you through it. Um, so there are different spaces in which uh, physical computing can uh, we can say actually takes place. Um, at, at the innermost level, um, you have this circle where. Um, you can have these devices on the person, and um, they, uh, and you have devices that you see on the top. For instance, on the top left, you have a device which can can capture the three D motion of the person. So you can have fully wireless three D motion capture in real time. So you have these devices that you can strap to the different limbs of the body, and you're you are you're sensing the data, the movement of your limbs, and you're also capturing the 3D orientation in real time. In other words, they're not only sensing, but they're also processing the data that they sense, and then they communicate wirelessly, say, to an avatar of some sort, which is being, which is being animated in, in real time. So that's an example of that, something on the person. Or you can move to the one in the middle. What you see is a, a spec device which can measure the rotation of the chest wall. And in so doing, you're able to uh, measure the respiratory rate and respiratory flow and the activity and the heart rate and um, things like what types of activity you've been involved in. Are you lying down? Are you sleeping? Are you standing? Um, are you walking? Um, and also the nature of your gait. Do you have an unsteady walk, for instance? So all this is being sensed, and then you see the computation. It's being computed on the device itself, and then communicated either to other such devices or to a base station so that it can, um, well, all this data from different sources can come in, and you can act on it. And the acting could be someone looking at the data and saying, um, you need to, um, you, know, you, you need to, uh, have some kind of support because your walk is either very unsteady or if your breathing is abnormal then you get some help coming to you. So so that, these are kind of examples of uh, physical computing where you're sensing the person or you're sensing the environment and you are processing the data in real time and you're extracting information which is in some senses useful that people can act upon. So, so that, uh, to me, um, is an example of uh, physical computing in action. And if you could go to the last slide, please. So um, I think one of the questions was, um, um, how do we incorporate physical computing in education? Now, we have been using the devices that come out of our research uh, actively in our undergraduate teaching, so students in our final fourth year or a senior year um, take an idea from um, uh, from the from a concept and take it right down to implementation in 10 weeks flat. So those are computer scientists who are doing it. But they're also working with design students and that's what this is showing here is that we're getting students drawn from uh, product design, textile design and visual communication courses and we have four 
two-day workshops culminating in an exhibition where the artifacts that they design are, are powered by spectral computing. And, uh, and if you look at the website, what's that space? Because on 20th of June, we're going to have populate that with the actual design and, uh, and videos of the, of the various design in action. So, so that, in summary, is, um, is, a, is a glimpse into some research that started 10 years ago called Speckle Computing, which has been continuing over the years. Lots of very interesting research issues, but also we're engaging with uh, end users. We are engaging with, uh, uh, with teaching. Um, both in computer science courses as well as in product design courses. That's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, CK, and thank you very much to all the speakers. So just to very quickly uh, try and filter uh, extraordinary diversity and range of presentations, the first thing that struck me is that even as a group of speakers, you're a mixture of artists, innovators, educators, designers, computer scientists, very much a new kind of hybrid and many of you spoke about the new forms of crossover interdisciplinarity multidisciplinarity hybridity and all the rest of it so one kind of question that obviously emerges is how can people feel confident that we can educate young people to take on these multiple roles and multiple disciplines given the um, extraordinary range that seems to be at stake in the new making uh, movement the second kind of questions that emerged it seemed to me was that on the one hand people were talking uh, very ambitiously about desires to change education in general uh, and uh, fundamentally change uh, uh, issues around um, how kids work, how kids learn um, and what they're learning. And at the same time what also came across was an extreme interest in very many different sites for learning, different kind of formal and informal and community-based questions. So I think this uh, raises a kind of tension as to whether the making movement is going to become mainstream or has to exist on the margins. Thirdly and fourthly kind of questions which emerge around where do the educators learn? DK talked at the end about um, how he's working with designers going out into to practice and Dave raised the question about how, uh, what, how, where do the teachers, where do the educators uh, learn to learn how to become educators in this kind of field? What's at stake in this kind of uh, challenge? And next there's a question that's clearly raised about what kinds of kids have access to these kinds of experiences. This is a question that has come through to us on Twitter as well. Is this a form of uh, a new form of elite or is this genuinely an accessible form of education? Finally, there are much more sort of philosophical questions at stake here. We've been asked um, particularly by uh, Christian to kind of contemplate the nature of making itself and how these new forms of making enabling new access to experiences and kind of forms of knowledge might transform our understanding of the making process itself. Um, and also the question about what happens when you start putting together these different fields, domains and experiences uh, or whether different kinds of uh, what kinds of knowledge and activity are produced. So I think these was, for me were some of the grand kind of themes and tensions that emerged throughout the discussion. Um, and I've fed back a few kind of uh, questions. There are some more specific questions that people want to know, like um, how long to be able to print specs on a 3D printer? Okay. <laughs> very soon. Not very, very soon. soon. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I don't know who wants to jump in and perhaps answer some of these uh, questions and respond to some of the challenges that you've posed each other. Dave, you are going to... Sorry, I, for example, I couldn't find my unmute button for a moment there. Sorry, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, of education, I think there's some, some, some very interesting kind of problems that, that, are, that are surfacing from, from this stuff. I mean, it's the idea of kind of physical computing, there's the kind of the Raspberry Pi, um, definitely in the UK, and, and Arduino. I think teachers are seeing this stuff, that they're, they're, they're latching onto it, and I think they see the incredible value of these things that um, they're they're easy to get into and they give amazing instant feedback uh, to people uh, you know turning lights on can be done in in, in, a, in a few you know less than an hour um, starting from nothing um, and and I think there's something astounding for kids about getting that physical response from from otherwise typing in uh, in a process that's really no different from filling in a form or writing an essay um, but the problem I think is is that it is so cross-disciplinary um, and and the way our 
kind of educational institutions are organized are around very kind of stratified subject areas. And I think this is a big challenge is, is how do you, you know, how would you frame um, teaching kids how to make a robot? Um, you know, it's one thing to come around with the, the physical design and the product design around there. Another side is, you know, computer science or, or, or ICT, however that shapes out, can easily deal with uh, encompassing the, the, the software engineering side of it. But I think the, the, the broader program, the awareness that everybody needs of every, every other aspect of the design um, and the design process is something that I, I guess we're not quite ready to deal with with the educational kind of models we, we currently have. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that hanging there. <laughs> okay. uh, ben, I think he wanted to jump in next. Yeah, sure. So um, I think Dave makes some good points there. Um, one thing that, that you mentioned that struck me is uh, the kind of variety of backgrounds that we come from and um, this kind of new trend that uh, we see kind of mixing arts and technology. So as it turns out, um, I also have a background in the arts. I did a, a, a master's at um, Tisch School of the Arts at this program called ITP, which um, some of you may know because uh, Tom Igo, who's one of the core members of the Arduino team, teaches physical computing there. That was um, one of the first places I'm aware of that had a formal physical computing component to their core education. Um, and since, since that time, um, we've you know, I've personally seen just the explosive growth of Arduino, um, both within and without traditional education settings. And I think um, something that's, that we'll see in the future uh, that will kind of speak to these, these transdisciplinary um, kind of maker uh, intuitions that we have is, is that we'll actually see more interdisciplinary programs. Um, so, so programs that are actually specifically designed to kind of mix and match um, people with different strengths. And um, as part of the challenges of the design process, like you're saying, um, if you have you know, an artist or a graphic designer and a computer scientist and a mechanical engineer, then you have all these different people that can contribute and learn from each other. Um, and that's certainly, I think, something that we'll, we'll continue to see a growth of in the future. Thanks so much, Ben. Christian, he wants to jump in. Uh, yeah, I just I had um, uh, a couple of uh, answer a couple of questions that had popped up on the the Twitter feed. Uh, questions about how educators learn how to become educators in the, in the field and uh, and how uh, teachers can feel comfortable taking on these new technologies. And I, I guess I just kind of wanted to speak to those um, questions specifically. And I think they're kind of related um, to to the previous comments as well. Um, in the way that uh, the, the maker car kind of is functioning as this model of uh, really kind of it's bringing the 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 projects to the for the kids to do, but it's it's also uh, it's this opportunity for the teachers to be engaged in the in the processes and um, uh, in a way that they can start to kind of understand how they might be able to incorporate uh, those those kinds of projects directly into their own curriculum. Um, so, for example, I, I had presented the uh, the example of that book project, and um, how can teachers kind of bring that into uh, to developing uh, ideas um, in their their language arts class, and uh, and kind of extending extending out from from the language arts. Um, so, I, I just kind of see that uh, the opportunity to be able to create models like this that uh, that allow for access for the teachers directly. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. uh, DK? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let, let me take the, um, the, the point being raised about, um, about education. So one can think of education. So we've been involved in, in several aspects of education. Of course, being in a university, uh, one of the, our primary aim is to bring the latest in research out to our undergraduate students. So we have a course um, in the senior year where we give the specs to the to the students, they work in groups and um, they take a concept right down to implementation and we've been doing this since 2003 so we have entire cohorts of students from um, the School of Informatics at Edinburgh University who have been trained on 
um, physical computing, if you want to call it that, for almost a decade. So that's that's one form of training. And the idea here is it's a slow way of disseminating this. But we've also been working with school children and and teachers. And the way we've been doing this is we have been taking our 3D motion capture and some applications involving, say, a analysis for golf swing, for instance. Uh, given that we are in Scotland, golf is very popular here. Um, we've been taking it out to the schools, and it's a fantastic way in which for the young children, ages between, say, 8 to 10 to 8 to 12, to actually see what is it that you can do with, uh, with computing um, as a discipline. So it's a very compelling way in which to interest uh, young children in in computing rather than presenting in a very dry way that is being done done at the moment. So and and we have also got together say the teachers of computer science and physics for instance from the various schools in Scotland. They tend to have these annual workshops where they all come together and we've been invited to go and present to them the the fantastic opportunities one has with these kinds of technology and sort of including them in the curriculum. But that is a slow process because you need to first get the teachers on, on side and then for them to actually include this in the curriculum. But what I find most exciting is the our latest venture whereby we actually um, work with design students. And I think that is fantastic because here they're very creative people and they always work with new medium, whether it's clay or stone or whatever it is. And this is the new medium which is coming along. And more importantly, the idea here is how do you design with information in mind? It's not just the, the electronics, but rather what do you do with the data? How do you present the data? So it's the computation which is just as important, not the physical realization of the electronics. So. As a computer scientist, I'd like to push that forward to the foreground is, is that how do you design with data? Is how do you design services with data? You know, and uh, in this case, using uh, these tangible devices, these physical computing that you have. So, so there are a number of different aspects that one can, one can address. Um, uh, getting it to school children, uh, getting it to into our undergraduate programs, training the teachers, and, and at the same time, getting it to other disciplines such as uh, designers. Thanks so much. Uh, ben, you're going to tell us about something called Spark Fun. <laughs> yes, so um, my other hat, uh, apart from academia, is, is as an educator uh, at an open source hardware company called Spark Fun Electronics here in Boulder. And um, part of what I do at, at the education department there is actually train the teachers and try to um, help them feel comfortable bringing some of this content into their classrooms and figuring out how best we um, as a company can can provide resources and kits for them to um, really feel comfortable about kind of taking this on and, and engaging students. Um, so it's been a really kind of informative process for us because um, you know, there's there's a an iterative kind of feedback cycle where, you know, we'll try um, a kid in the classroom and and we can see how it works and and make tweaks to that and uh, and um, we've actually uh, done a joint venture with one of the uh, classes at the University of Colorado, um, where you know we actually went into the class. Uh, every couple weeks and so we could um, they were following along with something we have called the spark fun inventors kit which is a series of 14 circuits that basically will take you through uh, basic Arduino programming digital um, analog ins and outs um, and working with sensors so uh, in addition to that um, so there's there's kind of the idea of how this kind of maker technology can fit in with what teachers have to do in the classroom. So how does it fit in with core standards, next generation science standards in the US? Um, and so we've been trying to figure out how best to correlate um, so that we're not just talking to uh, science teachers or engineering teachers, but as Christian mentioned, like how do you bring this into an English class? Um, so that's a lot of the, the formative work that we've been doing as well as uh, I'd like to stress the importance of not just offering kind of 
resources online, but also having boots on the ground has been the most effective way. Um, talking face to face with teachers is is really important to get them comfortable and get them excited about this. Uh, so one thing we did was at the NSTA, which is the National Science Teachers Association conference, we um, basically people could come by our booth and sew up a little conductive circuit with like some lily pad components, a little button holder and some conductive thread and some LEDs. And that um, we got such good reactions and feedback because they could tangibly see that this was something that they could do and they could bring it to their students. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, so there are obviously two kind of key constituencies that people are talking about here. One is around communities of teachers and educators and the other is kind of community uh, and people and the question particularly about uh, what kinds of kids are being, uh, you know, getting access to these kinds of experiences and what kind of initiatives need to take place to uh, create good kind of inclusion. So Dave, have you got something to add to that? Sorry, yes, got my, uh, my, my, my mute button again there. Yes, so, um, I mean, the model that we've kind of been working with is, is um, basically uh, just to encourage um, any kids who are expressing kind of passion and interest to be involved. So we very much have a model at MadLab that um, um, costs shouldn't be a barrier to participation. Um, we just kind of really want to encourage people who are genuinely interested in things. And I think the whole kind of general making movement is in quite a luxurious position at the moment that people that are interested in it, and it are particularly with kids who are interested in learning about it more, will go out of their way and kind of self-select themselves as a, as a community to, to participate in, in the, that kind of skill and personal development. Um, the question of you know, this hitting the mainstream and, and fitting into broader programs where every single kid in the country is, is doing um, kind of physical computing or internet connected devices as well as, um, um, you know, uh, craft design and technology, uh, as it was called in my day. I don't know if that still exists anymore. Um, but there's, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of kind of, I guess, there's issues around um, where um, the role of the edgy of an institution um, fit somewhere um, kind of community can support um, and enhance that that education um, I mean again we we work on quite a small scale and we have a lot of people in our communities who are who are kind of passionate and very very keen to to kind of influence um, what's happening and support what's happening uh, in terms of the um, I guess the physical computing and the the internet related um, stuff that we encourage kids to do outside school um, I think there's a big question about how that kind of work can can work alongside existing in institutional requirements, particularly around syllabuses. I mean, I think it's fair to say in the UK, we know that the current IT or ICT syllabus is, is broken, but how we fix that is still a huge question. Um, and I'm not sure how <laughs> what, the, what the answer is um, uh, for that. Um, I mean, there's an issue around kind of educators, specifically around educators that can en encompass and, and sit across these these different disciplines um, to, to particularly to be effective, and and whether schools need to think more around project-driven activities than than discipline-driven um, activities. Um, but I mean the um, Yeah, yeah. How do we how do we stop this just being fascinating hobbyist space and and, and and turn it into something that, that every kid can learn about? And also, do is this something that every kid should should learn about? Uh, which I'm going to leave as an open question. Okay. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, does anybody want to say a few more words? One of the things that strikes me is we want some people are talking about dedicated curriculum spaces, and yet they're talking about multi and interdisciplinarity. So there are some contra contradictions here. We're talking about working in the mainstream, but finding many other opportunities for young people to access and experiment uh, and use these technologies. We're talking about partnerships a lot, it seems to me, between universities and developers and forms of community-based education. And we can see that both in Scotland and um, uh, in, in the States. Uh, so I think the, these are obviously kind of preconditions here, which perhaps aren't that surprising, but it's kind of interesting to share them. Has anybody got a few, any other burning issues they'd like to raise before I 
hand over to Kylie to do a final summary and ending of the session. Nope. Okay. And um, by the way, to the general audience, we are also trying to feed in questions from the Twitter feed uh, and smuggle them into the discussion. Um, but we'll try and respond to those online if we can't cover everything now. So Kylie, can I hand over to you to uh, uh, speak to some of the questions and, and also to lead the session to a conclusion? Mute, Kylie. Unmute, Kylie. Thank you. And thank you, speakers. It's been uh, fabulous kind of hearing more about the programs that you're leading, um, about the, the ways in which you're conceptualizing the space between physical making and uh, digital technologies and, and the kinds of uh, new theorizing that's on the horizon, as well as the kinds of new educational practices. And so I, I look forward to kind of hearing more about that and, um, and to, to speaking to that work. I just want to close. There's a few unanswered questions that have been going through the Twitter feed and will uh, be, as Julian mentioned, following up with uh, pointers to resources, things like that, um, that have been going on. But, uh, but I do want to say that, that within the U.S. there is a new institution called MakerEd uh, that sees itself as the glue between these conversations. And so they, um, they are going to try to connect institutions around practice and so um, so we'll get you hooked up with them and send around some website materials um, they're just emergent um, uh, you know as is this discussion because of the uh, uh, the kinds of needs that are coming through the community I think one of the other questions that emerged within the chatter was around um, this idea of inclusion. And I think uh, this group in particular, we didn't have much time to speak to it today, but it is um, something that's, that's been well thought about and is at the core of kind of all of our practice. Um, and especially there's some new challenges with physical materials. You think about Raspberry Pi, although there's, there's some cost to it, it's much less than, say, a laptop um, into the computers for children. Um, and uh, other issues in my own work around e-textiles that we find the kinds of genres of work that you're doing, whether that's building a robot or, or working in e-fashion, for example, can really determine the kinds of outcomes and the kinds of inclusion um, that you have in your, in your um, workshops. And so if you're intending uh, you know, to attract a, a diverse audience, you know, thinking about the genres of work, thinking about the materials that you're using, the kinds of toolkits um, that appeal to your youth, I think is important. Um, and then there's another uh, layer to that in thinking about individuals with disabilities and how can we be inclusive of them as well. And um, that's a conversation that's going to take place um, at the Interaction Design uh, for Children uh, conference coming up here in New York. And uh, Ben is leading that conversation. So there's lots of pointers. We'll, we'll point you to more materials as we move forward. We look forward um, to meeting up with all of you again in two weeks. Uh, we've got um, uh, a series, our uh, next conversation is really going to be around um, uh, programming and coding. Um, so it's going to be on the 5th of June. You can meet us here at the same time um, uh, at, at 12 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, uh, uh, 17 at, at um, uh, General... Life PM. Okay, GMT. <laughs> and British summertime. For the summertime, <laughs> that, that acronym is not too good. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, not the physical uh, computing issues and the hardware issues, but we're going to be turning to programming and coding. So we're going to be looking behind the scenes and thinking more about what it means to get kids into, um, into these pieces and what's the uh, implications for both personal expression, for the global economy, and for civic participation. So please uh, join us then. Uh, we've got a range of speakers including uh, uh, Mitchell, um, uh, uh, G. Fernando, uh, Karen Brennan, uh, Joe Twist, and others. And so uh, we look forward to, uh, to you joining that conversation. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.